Hello, this is Amanda Welch welcoming you to this Bite Size Bio web seminar, which today is sponsored by Zeiss. Since 1846, it is the mission of Zeiss to constantly improve microscopy through innovation. With our unique portfolio of light, electron, ion, and X-ray microscopes, we enable research and industry for the challenges of tomorrow. Highly skilled application specialists support your work and make sure you get the most out of your investment. Today's presentation is titled, Enabling Connectomics with Multi-Beam Scanning Electron Microscopy. The world's fastest SEM just got even faster and is being presented by Dr. Annalena Eberl, Neuroscience Specialist and Product Manager for Zeiss Multisem. Annalena finished her PhD thesis in neuroscience at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen in 2011, followed by a short postdoc period. Throughout her scientific work, she used all kinds of microscopy techniques and has always been fascinated by the different facets that you can find within the same subject. In 2012, she joined Zeiss to support the Multisem team. As always, we will have a question and answer session after the presentation. So please type any questions that you have into the questions box, which appears on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll put them to Annalena at the end. So now, over to you, Annalena, for the presentation. All right. Thanks, Amanda, very much for the for the very kind introduction. So, hello, everybody that's listening. Um, I'm going to talk about the the multi-SEM, which is the, the first multi-beam scanning electron microscope in the world. And um, connectomics is one of the the fields of research that um, that first got interested in in such an ultra high throughput electron microscopic uh, methodology. So just brief introducing what connectomics actually means. Well, if you just have a look at, at Wikipedia, for example, there it says that connectomics is the production and study of connectomes, comprehensive maps of connections within an organism's nervous system, typically its brain or eye. And that's actually what it's all about. So neuroscientists in, in general want to, to understand the brain. They want to learn about the brain and, and learn how it, how it functions. And as structure and function usually is tightly coupled, there are several ways to approach um, the, the, this understanding of the brain. So you could go for a more macroscopic view and um, do behavioral studies or um, uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging. So all these things that are non-invasive and on the, working on the whole brain. Then you could go to a, to a well, to a more microscopic level with light microscopy, or if you want to have a look at, at the ultrastructural level, that, that gives you insight into, um, for example, how individual neurons are connected to each other. This is on the level um, that is only achievable with an electron microscope. So in principle, you first start with a brain. Typically, one of the model organisms here is a mouse. So you start with a mouse brain, and you take sections from this mouse brain, which for an electron microscope needs to be very, very thin. And in the end, this stack of images is reconstructed in the end. And in, at the very end, and at the, very, at the bottom right, you see an example from, from Harvard University. What comes out in the end is a, is a reconstruction of the components of this volume where you can see how individual neurons are connected to each other and can learn about the circuits, about the lo local circuits of the, of the brain. And by that, neuroscientists hope to, to learn about cerebral dysfunctions and, and how to fight neurodegenerative diseases. And on the basis of, of all this, then more, well, medical questions is the, the basic understanding and the, the learning of what there actually is. This is the example from the, from the first slide, from the bottom right, just um, taken as a video um, from, from the Lichtman lab in Harvard. And this is the, the, the very goal of this type of research. Here it is from a very small portion of the brain, a very small volume, and it's densely reconstructed. This means that everything within this given volume is, is segmented and in the end reconstructed. So, to go one step before that again, this gave you, a, a, well, the, the whole picture, the, the broad overview about what it's all about. Um, if you have a look at the, at the methodology, then first of all, we start with a mouse brain, which needs to be stained and embedded in a, in a resin, in a very hard material, to be able to, to cut very thin sections. This is 
are usually done with an ultramicrotome, which uses a broken glass knife or a diamond knife. And by that, you can get down to section thicknesses of 100 nanometers or 50 nanometers or even below that, like 30 nanometers section thickness. Um, typically, these ultra-thin sections um, were imaged with a transmission electron microscope. But recently, it became more and more uh, convenient to use an, a scanning electron microscope with these kind of, of samples. And one of the great advantages of a scanning electron microscope is that you can put the sections on a stable substrate. Typically, people use um, silicon wafers for that, which makes the, the sections much more endurable and um, enables you to image them over and over again, um, maybe put some other stainings on it in between and, and shuttle between light microscopes and electron microscope back and forth and collect all these sections as a, as a library which is very easy to handle. And I, can, I will go into, into this, well, in, into this methods that are shown on, on this slide uh, in a little bit more detail now. Um, usually this type of sectioning uh, was done manually, which is very tedious work and needs a lot of training. So people are trained over years to, to be able to really make um, large collections, large serial sectioning, um, la large sets of serial sections. And this became much much easier um, recently when a um, an automatic section uh, sectioning device became available, which was first developed at Harvard University and is now commercially available um, via RMC. And this tool, this device, is coupled to a standard ultramicrotome. And it's called Atomtome, which means automated tape collecting ultramicrotome. And the name already gives a hint on how it works. In principle, it, it attaches a conveyor belt mechanism to a microtome, where the conveyor belt in that in that case, it's, it's Kaplan tape, um, runs through the water trough of the microtome. And the sections, as they come off the, um, the tissue block and when they, uh, when they float on the, on the water so surface, um, they just float onto that tape that runs through the water trough. And um, the tape collects one section after the other. This can run automatically and unattended for, for hours and days. And in the end, it enables you to produce maybe 1,000 sections per day, something that's just a ballpark figure. You end up with, well, meters, literally meters of, of this captain tape with one ultra-thin section after the other. And that's how, how the actual sample carrier in the end looks like. So again, we have a silicon wafer and the captain tape that is cut into shorter strips and then glued onto the silicon wafer with uh, sticky carbon tape. So the, this, uh, this smaller, darker regions on this brighter strips, these are the ultra-thin sections that are stained with, well, a lot of very bad chemicals. Usually it's, um, it's a mixture of, um, of heavy metals that, that gives the, the contrast for the electron microscope, and that's what makes appear them so dark. Um, on, for, for that type of approach and to, um, to, to register the positions of the, the samples to, to the images you take afterwards, it's useful to have fiducials. In that case, people use fiducial TEM grids for fiducials, which are just glued on different positions of, um, of the wafer. And by, by registering the coordinates of this fiducials, um, in the end, you can, if you take the sample carrier out of the microscope and back again after days or weeks or even years um, by just registering the, the, the coordinates of the fiducials with the ones that were saved together with the images, you're just able to, to find your, um, your reasons of interest again. Now, this is not just one wafer, which, well, there are maybe 200 sections on it. So in the end, when you when you want to cover a larger volume, like for example a cubic millimeter, in the end this would need a whole well a whole set of these wafers. And you will end up with about 150 of these wafers to cover just a, just a millimeter in the z direction. 
I already pointed out that um, it is possible to, to shuttle these, um, these samples back and forth between the light microscope and the electron microscope. And especially in the case for the multisem, but also for, for a lot of other correlative microscopy approaches, um, the, the first step would be to go to a light microscope uh, in our lab. It's just an example. We have an axial imager. And we have a dedicated sample holder on the light microscope stage that take the, the sample holder from our electron microscope. So in the end, we can, again, register the positions of the, the images that we take with the light mi microscope uh, to the stage of the electron microscope, and therefore we find the regions um, in, in both imaging modalities very easily. That's the so-called shuttle and find approach. In the end, you can load, uh, you can import the, the overview image that you took with a light microscope, which is basically an overview image of the whole wafer in that case that is shown here. You can import that to, to the, um, the software of the electron microscope and um, plan your experiments, set up the regions that you want to image, and in the end, navigate on, on your sample. Now, in principle, until now, this is, this is all very well doable with a single beam SCM as well. Um, there are several solutions for that. One, for example, is, um, is the so-called Atlas software, which is able to connect the data sets from a whole variety of different imaging modalities and combine these. Um, but if we now consider um, the throughput, if you want to image a, a large volume, a larger volume, like, for example, a cubic millimeter, doesn't sound too much, but in electron microscopic dimensions, this is a whole lot. So if you cut this cubic millimeter of tissue at 50 nanometers, well, just for the sake of, of the easy numbers for, for the math here, um, as I said, you can go below that, like 30 nanometers. But if you go for 50 nanometer section thickness, this will end up with 20,000 sections. So in the end, it's 20,000 square millimeters that needs to be imaged. A state-of-the-art single-beam SEM that is well-equipped um, needs, well, ballpark figure of around two and a half hours to image an area of, of a square millimeter with a pixel size of four nanometer, which is, well, the resolution that is sufficient um, and basically which is needed um, to, uh, to get images that are well resolved enough to, uh, to, to make a circuit reconstruction in the end. Data-wise, um, <laughs> this will give 1,250 terabytes of data, which is 1.25 petabytes, basically. So now we can use, um, beyond the terabyte, we can also use the petabyte um, uh, term. And if we now do the math here, um, this will just end up with more than 2,000 days of pure imaging which is almost six years. And that is just a, an amount of time that, that no project will actually really start. No postdoc can do that. And of course, no PhD student. Now, this is the point when, when the idea of a multi-beam electron microscope comes into play. A single beam SEM is inherently slow. All scanning techniques are more or less inherently slow because they they are working serially. They are imaging um, pixel by pixel while the uh, the electron beam or maybe if it's a light microscope, the laser beam um, rasterizes over over the area to um, to be to, that is to be imaged. Of course, there are ways to to increase the speed here. One could, for example, just well, scan the electron beam a bit faster. But then in the end, um, we run into, into the limitations that are given by the detector. Each detector usually has um, a, a, a given temporal bandwidth because it needs a certain time for recovery. Otherwise, the, the signal cannot be resolved anymore. On the other hand, um, another limitation that comes into play here is the signal to noise. If we scan too fast, then the signal we produce is not good enough, it's not high enough to, to, um, to generate an image. So one, one way how, how to deal with that would be just to increase the beam current, which in the end gives you more signal. But then 
the as electrons are charged particles, if if you increase the beam current too much, um, these charged particles um, begin to to see each other. They they begin to repel each other, and this in the end would mean that you lose the the focus on your sample surface, and therefore the the resolution. One way to to circumvent this this limitations um, is well, going for multiple beams in parallel. This was the approach that, um, that Zeiss took uh, while um, developing the multisem. Now, we can spread the, the total current over multiple beams, and therefore we can keep a very good focus, a good resolution. And on the other hand, it's not necessary to, to scan, let's say, beyond standard level. Um, the frequency can be kept in a, at, a, at a normal range, and well, still we increase the throughput massively by just using several beams in parallel. So, how does this work? This is, of course, the, the question. Uh, let me start this little animation. Now, a single electron source produces a single electron beam, which goes through a multi-hole aperture, and therefore ends up as an array of multiple beams. These are shown in blue. And they are bent with an electromagnetic beam splitter towards the sample surface and focused onto the surface, scanned globally. The secondary electrons, these are shown in green, that are generated on the sample surface are collected and separated from the other electrons by the beam splitter. The signal electrons that are generated on the surface while, while the beams scan over the surface, they are projected onto a scintillator, which is shown on the, on the right. And the changes in signal intensity over time while scanning over the sample surface, this is detected from the backside of the scintillator with an array of detectors, which is na namely one detector per beam. And these, in the end, generate the individual images of the individual beams. So, just to compare that to a single beam SEM, at the same time that a single beam SEM would take to image the, the small area in the center, the multi-SEM images the whole large field of view at once. And if you now want to go for even larger areas than just this single field of view, this single hexagonal field of view, you just move the stage in between and create a mosaic um, over, for example, a square millimeter, which, which is shown in, in this example here. But I mean, this is not a this is not a, um, a, a given physical limitation. Uh, of course, the areas could be larger. This is just the example that is shown here. Um, to put it in a well, in a more schematic way, um, and again, this is um, this is also uh, already published. Um, you can you can see the uh, you can see the link to the to the publication um, in the bottom. Um, the primary electron beam is split up to multiple beams. These are focused onto the surface. The signal electrons that are generated are collected and projected back to a to a multi detector. And the individual detectors for each beam generate the images for the individual beams. This is an example of an ultra-thin mouse brain section we get from Jeff Lichtman from Harvard University. This is a 61-beam image, um, which is merged to a well to one field of view, and it's taken at about four nanometer pixel size, 100 nanoseconds dwell time, which ends up in about 470 megapixels per second, because this whole field of view is imaged in just 1.3 seconds, and to give you a little bit of an idea how, how large this field of view is, we have about 110 microns from left to right and about 100 microns from top to bottom. So this is the, the field of view that we imaged at once. And this is an example of what you end up with um, when you create a mosaic for a larger section. Uh, for a larger area. So this is a complete mouse brain section. At the top right, um, you can see the, the cortical surface, actually. And the, the margins of, of, this, of this image already show you that it's a composition of individual hexagons. 
Um, now, this is a data set that can be taken fully automatic. It's about 300 gigabytes data size. And um, the section has, a, has an area of almost, well, a little bit more than three square millimeters. Typically, we can image such a section in, let's say, well, 15 to 20 minutes. One square millimeter can be typically imaged in about 6.5 minutes. It depends a little bit on the actual imaging parameters and on the, on the um, sample properties, but something between 5 and 10 minutes is, is, very, is, is the typical imaging time. And the square millimeter we already saw, and which is an actual cutout from this data set, is also shown on the Zen browser, which is a, a well an online source where you can view this data set. So just quickly switch over to the Zen browser. Um, there are also other imaging examples, but just to stick with this um, square millimeter of tissue here, um, here you can play around, zoom in. Takes short time to. get the focus right. But this is a way where you can assess the, the image quality that can be achieved. So here you can see, for example, the nuclear pores, um, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, and so on. Now back to the talk. Okay. Um, this gives you an idea of how such a multi-beam electron microscope works. But what if this is just not fast enough? Now, there's a solution for that. You just add more beams. Um, so it's a highly scalable technology. Um, the 61 beams were just the, the first step. Um, there's a 91 beam tool available now, which is just adding one shell to the hexagon one additional shell of beams to the hexagon. Um, and this is a, a tool of Rhine that was just very launched very recently, about a month ago, at the Neuroscience in uh, Chicago. Now, with this 91 beam multi-SEM, it's not that we added more beams to, to the field of view. Um, we also increased the distance between the beams. So the actual field of view of the 91 beam version of this tool is about 3.5 times larger. And by this, it, it actually in increases the throughput by more or less this factor as well. Now the question always is, with new technologies, how mature is it? Can you work with that? And um, there are two, uh, two of these systems are installed um, in, the, in the neuroscientific um, research direction. And uh, the first one went to Jeff Lichtman's lab in Harvard University, which is the, the quite happy man that we see standing in front of his um, multi-stem here, which was uh, mid-2014. And in one of the, the most recent um, publications, there's, there's already a um, uh, well, there, that shows already a little bit from, from the multi-SEM. The second system within neuroscientific research um, went to Martin Street near Munich uh, into the lab of Winfried Denk at the Max Planck Institute of Neurobiology. Uh, this was in, in spring 2015, and this is a 91-beam machine. So both of the two variants are already installed in the field. And here again, um, there is a, a publication out about whole brain staining, which already gives an idea in which direction Winfried Denk is uh, planning to go with that tool, um, which also shows um, a, a little assessment of the, of the multi-beam. Now, um, I, in the beginning, I quickly pointed out um, that uh, shuttling the um, the samples between light and electron microscope is a, is a very nice and easy way to, to navigate, for example, on the sample. And 
one way that makes it especially easy for the multi-beam SEM is that it actually features the same software than our light microscopes. It's Zen. Um, it's very workflow-oriented um, with a strong focus on, on ease of use. And um, a lot of features uh, in, in this software are designed um, to facilitate and automate, especially the serious section imaging. Um, I will now quickly skip to an offline version of the software, so there's no, there's no hardware behind this, but it's the actual um, software. And um, one of the things uh, that, that makes serious section imaging very easy is, for example, the automatic section detection. So what we see here in the background, that's um, a light microscopic overview image of, uh, of two captain strips with ultra-thin sections on it. And when I now define, first of all, I define a ribbon, which means this is a, well, a strip where serious sections are to search. And then I um, mark the borders of one individual section and tell the algorithm to search for the rest. I now do it only for a, um, for a small example because this is just a standard laptop and no works, workstation. So it runs a, um, a small MATLAB engine in the background and now it already found um, the, the other sections automatically. In principle, if you would do that on a, on a more sophisticated workstation, um, you of course would do this with a with a whole strip of um, of sections and with a whole with a whole wafer full of these captain strips. Um, now, if you don't want to image the whole section, with a, yeah, which is still fairly large, um, you mark a region of interest, or maybe or maybe two, just as as you want. Apply these to the others. And then all these regions can be transferred to the so-called tile setup. Oh, I think I did it twice, so maybe I just delete that. I just show it again. This is the regions that we want to image. and I transfer all these regions to the tiles setup, which already has um, the, the very same overview image from the light microscope in the background. And here it now um, shows the, the individual regions of interest, which are tessellated in hexagonal field of view because this is the, the special thing about this microscope, the hexagonal array of electron beams. Um, if I would have a multi-SEM here now <laughs> in my meeting room where I do this webinar, then um, I would also uh, go for um, the focus strategy, uh, which means I can, I can distribute focus port points on one of these regions. And when I then start an experiment, uh, the software, first of all, um, uh, direct the microscope to this fo focus support points where the the focus is found uh, automatically, and a plane is interpolated um, through this focus support points so that in the end we don't need to focus and stick mate on each of these tiles that is imaged, which in the end again increases the throughput. Um, and then in principle, I would just start the experiment and well go drink coffee or. I'll just do some other work, write a paper, whatever. Um, to just quickly sum this up, um, the Zen software for Multisim features the automatic section detection, and actually the whole the whole microscope features a whole lot of automation um, because. In the end, you don't want to deal with 61 or 91 electron beams individual and manually. That's just not that's just not possible. You don't want to do that. 
So there's um, a lot of algorithms that, that tune the microscope automatically so that the images are always nice and that um, organize the, the experiment, that everything runs smoothly and you can just let it run unattended. Um, so for the experiment setup, we first start with the section detection and the, the region of interest transfer from one section to the other. This also um, does not only uh, translate the region of interest with respect to the section uh, margins, it also rotates it so that you always hit the region of interest in the individual sections that you were, um, that you were targeting. Um, this again uh, shows the, the idea of the focus strategy, uh, which just gives you the opportunity to not um, just make a, a focus and stigmation step on each nth tile, like every fifth or every tenth, um, but but gives you the opportunity to to really map a focus plane through the whole area that you want to image. And in principle, you can also do that on the whole wafer um, already with a light microscope image, because light microscopes also have an autofocus function. And therefore, in the end, you save a whole lot of time uh, because the um, the, the focus depth is already preset, and uh, the autofocus of the multisem just needs to adjust for a small area, uh, for a small, um, for a small range. Um, when you then start the experiment, this is what you would actually see at the microscope. So it's not well, it's not very um, spectacular because in the end, um, you just see hexagons turning green when they are imaged, and this in a frequency of maybe two or three well, every two or three seconds, one of these hexagons will turn green and um, the data will be saved to the hard drive or to a whole pile of hard drives, actually. Because um, in the end, uh, at the end of the day, um, when the machine is running full speed, um, it will generate something between, well, 10 and 15 terabytes of data per day. Now, um, to just quickly sum up the, the whole workflow and what it's all about and how this would look like with a, with a multi-beam SEM. Um, you start with a single hexagon with a single field of view that is composed of um, 61 or 91 individual smaller images, which are then merged to the hexagonal complete field of view. When you move the stage and, and create a mosaic of a larger area, um, this is then stitched and and uh, and registered to the to the stage coordinates. Um, the 2D images are stacked in the, in the third dimension to reconstruct uh, the the volume that you previously sectioned, and um, the the data set is then in the end also segmented and. Um, and the reconstructed components of the volume then can be rendered and visualized as, again, shown on the, on the right um, bottom of this slide. Um, and this last part of the segmentation and the visualization uh, is maybe the most exciting one, because um, this is still subject to, to cutting-edge research, um, with groups all over the world working on, on different strategies and different approaches to, to solve this challenge especially for larger amounts of data. By now, the largest data sets that are reconstructed are maybe, well, in, in the tenth of microns uh, cubic range. Um, I think the largest data set I've heard of is about 350 microns uh, in, um, cubic. Um, and, and this was, I think, taken at a larger pixel size. Um, so again, this is, uh, this is really a, um, a challenge that needs to be solved. And maybe um, the multi in the end might be one of the, the drivers to pace this research up a little bit, <laughs> as uh, here the amount of data is just orders of magnitude higher. So to just quickly sum up the, the technical key facts about the, um, this, well, first multi-beam scanning electron microscopes in the world, the 61-beam version and the 91-beam version, um, the the top net speed of the 91 beam version is about two terapixels per hour, or to um, to say it in a, in a maybe more um, in, in an easier way uh, to to grab it, um, a square millimeter can be imaged in well in a time frame of 
about three minutes with a 91 beam tool and maybe five to ten minutes with a 61 beam tool, as compared to two and a half hours with a standard single beam SEM. Um, the resolution is um, four nanometers with the 61 beam tool and eight nanometers with the 91 beam tool. Um, and this is something that is, of course, as compared to single beam tools, not that cutting edge, but it's a very dedicated tool for a certain set of applications and that's what we started with. The degree of automation is extremely high, so we really aim for continuous high throughput imaging, which is not, it's not really 24-7, but we aim for 23-7, which would mean that after 23 hours of imaging, the machine would need an hour to, to go through its alignment procedures to set everything up again, and then uh, imaging can, uh, can go on. And, um, well, the applications that, that we are aiming for um, is everything that where ultra-high throughput electron microscopy might be needed. Uh, so the, 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 first, the first people that got interested were neuroscientists that um, want, to, want to reconstruct uh, sig more significant uh, volumes of the brain. Um, but also in, in semiconductor industry and semiconductor research, uh, this uh, this machine um, raised some some interest because here as well, its um, the structures on on chips on on uh, integrated circuits become smaller and smaller, and um, it becomes more and more necessary to to use an electron microscope to to assess these. And as a, uh, a single a single individual die of a of a silicon wafer is about well two and a half by two centimeters in size. Um, this again is is quite a challenge for for a single beam electron microscope to um, to image. And now at the very end, um, I want to close this with a well with a strong acknowledgement to to my colleagues, to the people um, here within my group at Zeiss, who who made this possible in the end. Um, so here in the background is a, it's a group picture um, which was taken in our lab of the first multi-SIM prototype. So this was in 2013. Um, you can see it in the back without the housing. Um, and without these people, this would just not have been possible. So we're a dedicated group of about 30 people that work on this, on this project since, well, it's quite some years now. And um, I want to thank you all very much for your attention here and um, we'll hand it over to, to Amanda now. Thanks, Annalena. That was an excellent presentation. We have a few questions from the audience. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to post it in the questions box that appears on the right of your screen. So the first question I have is, what kind of biological results would you expect from such a data set? So, well, in the end, when um, when such data set is, is fully reconstructed, fully segmented, um, then you, you could, for example, look uh, for how, how many connections does one neuron make with another one, and why doesn't it have as many connections to the third one? Um, because with, with light microscopic data, sometimes it's hard to tell if a, if a connection is actually there, and when you um, do fluorescent labeling, for example, you only see what you've labeled, and you don't see all the rest. And that's the nice thing about about electron microscopic data that in the end you you, you see everything. So if if it's fully reconstructed, you have you have the full picture of everything that is within this volume. And um, well, yeah, people people hope to um, to in the end compare uh, well data from from healthy individuals with with for example people or well model organisms uh, with. Uh, degenerative diseases and see if, for example, the, the connection statistics um, change. So the larger the data set gets, the better the statistic is in the end. And it's not just sparse sampling, but you can do real quantitative statistics on it. And, well, what actual results come from that, I mean, well, we'll, we'll see, I think. That sounds really cool. Um, so kind of along those lines, how would numbers for data size and imaging time scale for larger brains? Because you mentioned model organisms and then mm. something. So um, I, I gave the, the numbers for a cubic millimeter of tissue. So if you just recall that, um, with uh, 
so with a with a single beam SEM, we would be in the range of about six years. Oh, and I think I ha, now you remind me. Um, I, I think I didn't mention that um, with the 61 beam tool, this six years number could be cut down to maybe something like four months. Oh wow! Um, wow. Yes, that's. <laughs> I, I just realized that I forgot to say that. <laughs> um, that's it. It is quite a decrease. And so if you think of a mouse brain, this actually has already 500 cubic millimeters of tissue. So if you want to go for a whole mouse brain then, um, it's, it's 500 times this four month imaging time, at least. Um, and if you then want to go to even larger brains, which is, um, I mean, a human brain has about 1.5 liters volume. Um, I mean, this is really this is really beyond um, imagination right now. But well, in well within 10, 20 years, we'll see what what comes. Um, but I think the next challenge is already the um, the complete mouse brain. And I mean, there are also smaller brains. For example, the Etruscan shrew, which is a, a very small animal, and the brain is is actually just a um, the whole animal is about two grams. And, and the brain just just has I don't know maybe well 50 milliliters something like that so this is really tiny and so th this is maybe maybe more approachable but then on the other hand um, there are a lot of things um, that still can be done to to this technology there are a lot of ways how one can um, speed up single beam SEM like for example um, using a continuous scan mode while moving the, the stage continuously which makes you yeah but which gets you rid of the the stage overhead and and these are all things that that can be done with a multi beam SEM in the end as well but yeah one one number is maybe that um, uh, if, if we come up with a whole brain, then we're in the range of about, I think, an exabyte of data. So this is not not just a petabyte, but then we're then we're in the exabyte range somewhere. Wow, <laughs> I can't even fathom that amount of um, data. Um, and we have a question from uh, Vito. He's asking, or she, sorry, is asking um, if it's necessary to stain samples, and if so, with what? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, oh, actually, that's our experience so far. I mean, we're, it's a pretty new technology, and we're still, we, we ourselves are still learning about it. But um, staining, uh, in, in my opinion, is, is really required um, because uh, when, you, well, what you actually introduce to a sample when you want to use it for electron microscopy is you put heavy metals in it because these heavy metals give you the signal electrons when you hit it with a primary electron beam. So the more heavy metals are in the sample, the better your signal gets. And there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole range in, in well, which amount of staining is still, uh, makes the sample still suitable for, for a given type of microscopy. In principle, um, any TEM staining protocol um, would work for, for the multi-SEM or for maybe for, for any scanning electron microscope. Okay, and I have a follow-up question from Vito. Um, saying, um, asking about the physics of the detector. So standard mm -hmm. SEM can abuse secondary electrons and backscattered mm -hmm. electrons and so forth. Um, and so he was asking about the um, type of detector. Yeah, this is um, very different from a single beam SEM actually. So um, first of all, it's secondary electron detection only. This is this is a limitation um, that, well, when, well, needs to take into account um, when, when using such a tool. Um, and the detection is a, is a two-step process. Um, so I showed it with this small animation in the beginning that the signal electrons, the secondary electrons, um, are collected and projected onto a scintillator. So um, we get for, for each individual signal beam, we get a bright spot on, on the scintillator. And on the back side of the scintillator is a bundle of, um, of light fibers. And this, uh, this glass fibers um, transmit the signal from the individual uh, signal spots to um, avalanche photodiodes, so to, to photo detectors, basically. And, and this is a set of 61 detector sends, so, so each of the signal spots has its own detector. And while the beams are scanning over the surface, 
and um, the, the signal spot onto the scintillator changes its intensity depending on how much signal is generated at a certain spot on the sample. Um, this, in the end, uh, generates the, um, the, 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 the individual image for each individual beam. So I hope this was not too... Uh, <laughs> too, too too complicated. I, I'm I'm sorry, but if there's a, a follow up question, then I. <laughs> oh, Vita says that um, they get it. Thanks for answering his question. All right. Okay. <laughs> Good. So I have another question about um, what kind of support from the manufacturer can customers expect because it's a very new and unique technology. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a quite good question. I'm. Uh, you might have realized it on the very first slide, which uh, showed the housing of, of this microscope, um, where it says Multisim 505 Research Partner Program. And the Research Partner Program is actually a, a tool um, with which we want to, to do this very early marketing of, of a new technology, um, which basically means we're looking not just for customers, we're looking for, um, for partners. Um, who are willing to, to take a certain risk together with us. Um, and on the other hand, what we offer um, at, at this point in time uh, to, to the first 15 tools um, that, are, that are sold is, um, well, strong developmental support from, from here, from our team in Oberkochen. Um, so there's a well, half a person month of customization effort that we um, that we put into into any of these tools so in, in most cases it's um, it's software um, that it's just customization of the software to a certain application but it, it could be in principle anything that's related to that microscope um, then we uh, we give a very extensive um, application training yeah, before the tool is shipped and then afterwards um, well what else what else um, we give some, uh, for example, support for scientific outreach. So um, within this, this research partner program, we will support people going to conferences, like with travel grants or like also organizing uh, sessions or conferences. So we give financial Would support there. Would students or postdocs be um, eligible for travel grants? Well, the, uh, or I just mean, the PI? The, Ah no no no. Um, well, I mean, this depends. I would say this depends on the PI. So <laughs> I, I I cannot really answer that. But of course, well, it, of course, it's not it's not necessarily the PI. So yeah, that's it on that end. I think. Uh, oh yeah, and there's a uh, um, the servicing for the tool. Um, this is already this is already included um, in the purchase price and is about all the five years are already um, included there. So it's uh, uh, it's not for this fi first five years. It's not necessary to have a service contract. Oh, that's nice, and especially with the length of grants. That seems yeah, to and work right yeah. in there. Yeah, and we we cover everything basically during that period of time. So also all consumables and. Wow, so I guess kind of following up on that um, partner program, but also just in general, what other samples or applications do you all intend to target? Mm. So, um, as I said, by now it's um, uh, brain mapping or conectomics is um, the, the hot topic <laughs> for this tool, and, and most of the software was, um, was uh, well, focused onto that to facilitate that, um, that workflow. But in principle, um, any any serial sectioning um, of other tissues, uh, so not necessarily brain tissue, um, and not maybe not necessarily with the aim to to reconstruct it in the end, um, would be I think well suitable. So, for example, if you want to screen through, um, let's say a set of mouse mutants uh, that are treated differently, or or maybe even cell cultures. Um, so any any screening application um, might be might be uh, an application uh, that might make use of of this high throughput here. And then on the on the material science side, um, as I said, any semiconductor application um, is is very interesting. Um, and what can I think of? Ah, and we have. Um, yeah, we have one uh, one person uh, we are in contact with very, for a very long time now, and she's looking into bones. So she polishes uh, the bone surface, 
and um, wants to to look into the ultra structure of of, of this uh, of the bone structure and uh, relate that to um, to to LSM to light microscopic data from that very same samples. Um, so it's it's not it's not even only soft tissues, um, but uh, if you, if you code it uh, and, and stain it, you can you can also image uh, other type of tissues with that. Okay, and I also saw that, um, or I remember hearing during your presentation that you could do things with um, going back and forth between the light microscope and the mm -hmm. SCM. So um, what methods for sample presentation are suitable for this technology and are compatible with methods for uh, light microscopy as well, kind of that correlative, mi correlative microscopy methods? Uh, th this is in, in general um, a challenge. So. To, um, to, to have sample prep methods that are suitable for light and electron microscopy. This is also something that is um, under research uh, for, with many, many groups. Um, so usually it's, it's a trade-off somehow um, because either the ultra structure is not as good because the embedding is not as good, and on the other hand, the staining for the electron microscopy um, usually destroys fluorescence that would be needed for light microscopy. Um, but uh, there are a lot of groups uh, worldwide that are working on that. Um, just to name a few is maybe Stephen Smith in, at Allen Brain Institute um, or, or Christa Genou in, at, the, at the Friedrich Miescher in, in Basel. And we're in contact with several of these groups. And um, uh, yeah, well, so we're working on that. But um, I think by now there's not the the single one recipe that works for all. I think this by now doesn't exist, but a lot of people working on that. And um, yeah, I mean, it's th this of course with this um, with this section ultra thin section on on a wafer approach. This is really very interesting. There are also ideas to um, to for example label uh, against some antibodies. Uh, image that with a light microscope, then with the electron microscope, then wash off the label um, and put on another label. Uh, so th there are publications about that, and, and this seemed to work. And then in the end, um, th this opens up, um, well, a lot of questions, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, um, I think, one, one last question from uh, Blanca. And they ask, is this method still faster and better than serial block face imaging? Um, the, the imaging itself, of course, is faster because um, the, the the block face also just uses a, um, a single electron beam by now. I mean, as I, I mentioned that uh, one of these multi-beam tools is uh, at Winfried Denk's lab in, in Martinsried. And... Um, I mean, he's he's somehow the the godfather of block phase imaging, I would say. So we'll see what what comes uh, from that end in the next years. Um, but so from the from the sample preparation side, um, I would say the the block phase imaging um, might have a little advantage, especially on the post processing side, because it's much easier to um, to align the, the the images in 3D and you don't have distortions. But on the other hand, you also sacrifice the, the the sample, so you can only image it once. And if anything goes wrong with the imaging during the the the, the section through during the the block phase imaging experiment, then actually the sample is gone. And that's the the nice thing with the with the serial section on on a solid substrate approach that you you keep the sample and you can image it all and all, over and over again. And maybe one two years later, you you come up with another question for the same data set. And, and you can just image it again. Um, so I think from the, from the, yeah, there are advantages and disadvantages to, to both of these approaches. And well, it depends a lot on the, on the question you ask, on the research question. So speaking of questions, there's Caroline who has, is a student of histotechnology. And she was wondering if this technology would at some point come into diagnostic pathology, like to scan tumors and further study their structure and maybe to minimize error in cancer diagnosis? Hmm. Well, maybe. Um, by now, it definitely is a research tool. Um, we have, well, if, if a, a medical diagnostic tool um, has, well, the requirements to, to do something like that are really, really high. So you have to certify it for, for medical diagnostics and stuff like that. And for that, um, the 
the few tools that are installed in the field, I think, are, are just not enough experience to, to go for that. So by now, it's really just a research tool. But, well, just, I mean, research is good. <laughs> and, um, and also on the, on the medical side, of course, there's, uh, there's a lot of, of basic research and um, ground truth basic research going on. Um, and therefore, asking medical questions, I think, definitely is, is worth it. And again, we're, we're in contact with a, few, um, with a few people also in that direction. But um, for diagnosis, I think this is, um, well, still some way to go. I would assume maybe at least a few years. And, and that's basically uh, well, the most uh, due to the, the, the certification things. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the seminar. So thanks again, Annalena, for a very illuminating presentation and a great discussion. And thanks also to our sponsor, Zeiss. And finally, thanks to you, the audience, for taking the time to attend and listen in. If you've enjoyed the seminar and would like to view the video recording of the session, please visit the seminar's page on bitesizebio.com. It should be available within the next 24 hours. There you can also see the other webinars we have lined up for you in Bite Size Bio's webinar festival. So until next time, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Zeiss and Bite Size Bio. Goodbye and thank you.